heart, uh, I need to bring you to Omaha. And uh, so he said that would be great. And he kind of told me a couple of prophetic things of why this church is here uh, in Nebraska. And, you know, we're not here to compare with any other churches or say we're, we're greater. But each church, if you read in the book of uh, Nehemiah, there was 12 gates in the city. And each of those gates had a different name and a different function. Well, so do churches in cities as they make up the gate. And, uh, you know, remember there was the fish gate. There was the, I remember all the other ones, dung gate. We don't want, you know, we're not calling churches dung gates. But, but we'll leave that up to God to decide if that's a dung church or not. But, uh, but yeah, there was the sheep gate. So we'll just pull it back in here. But... In, in every church, there's always a, a certain grace or calling that God does give to. Uh, so one church isn't called to do what another church is called to do. And so he was really giving us a prophetic, uh, me a prophetic word on really why this church is here. It's outstanding. And so I'm looking right now at July 18th to have him come here to Lord of Post Church. And he's going to bring his band. He's going to bring his team, so it'll be really great. And what's so funny about it is I said, now, Robin, you know, I'm doing something I really shouldn't do. He said, what's that? I said, my staff always tells me, because they, you know, Amy, my assistant, after uh, over 20 years and the staff, they manage four calendars for Brenda and I. And so they always say, do not, pastors, book anything. And so I just went ahead and booked it. I hope it works. So anyway, let's just kind of see what happens. Hopefully there's not something else. All right, why don't you open your Bibles to the book of Ecclesiastes. And uh, you that are watching it in chapel and in this, uh, this audience today and those that might watch on the archive, please go back and... Uh, Listen to the first service. There was a powerful prophetic word that came over the nation, but also, uh, didn't God prophesy about Israel? Yes. Something about Israel. Uh, so that was very interesting. You can go back and watch that as well as the teaching. It was a real mentoring anointing that I felt like would be beneficial if you really want to grow uh, in the things of God. And, uh, you know, I always like these services that we preach is we don't try to tailor, what do you call it, cookie cut it, make it like, you know, the first first one like the second one, but there will be times that things may be a little bit repetitive, and the reason being is, you know, there's four Gospels, for example, because you can read something in Matthew and find something in the book of John, and it's the same story, but you get a different picture, or there's something that's included, or something that's said, even though it's the same, you know, topic or content, so in the same way that the Holy Spirit does that with, with both services. I want you to look at Ecclesiastes chapter uh, 1. We've been talking about a restoring of Pentecost. And we're going to get into what that means as we look at uh, what actually happened on Pentecost. So keep that in mind as we get ready to look at what happened on the day of Pentecost as we look at the scripture in Ecclesiastes chapter 1. I also want to give a shout out to Shannon from Daystar. Uh, He is here again and uh, he is working with uh, training our people again. He is one of the best sound and audio techs in, in the, I think, in the world. And so Shannon, thank you for being here. Give our love to Marcus and Joni. Let them know that we love them and we'll be coming down soon. And uh, we love to be able to be on Marcus and Joni again and all that. Uh, I want you to look at Ecclesiastes 1.9. And this is a very important scripture when you understand how God does things. Now, before I say this scripture, always remember that God and history repeats itself. But God is not always a God that repeats himself because Isaiah 43, verse 19, you can write that down. The Bible says, behold, I do a new thing. Before it springs forth, I tell you of it. In other words, there's new things that God does. It's, it's not always a repeating of history or, or events. But how many of you have ever heard about history where God moved on a city, he moved on a people, he moved on a person, he moved on a church? I mean, let me give you an example. Martin Luther uh, God moved on a man, and the whole Protestant movement was, was formed off of a man who, you know, had a reforming spirit. And always remember this, reformation is, is, is not pretty. Reform is never comfortable. It's never easy. Reform always requires someone to stand up and take a risk and take a chance. Reformers and a reformation, when it first starts off, is oftentimes not followed by the masses. It usually started off by a few, and then the masses begin to catch a hold of the reform or what's needing to be changed, and they say, wow, this is truth. And I say that because right now, people are crying out, we sung about revival, and you have to understand what the difference is between revival and reformation. 
And this is important to know this because God is in the middle of renaissance, which is new. New things are getting ready to happen. New things that we've never, never seen before. That's what the renaissance movement, if you study about renaissance art and stuff, it was, it was a new thing that, that happened. And it, that's what renaissance means. It means something new, something fresh. But here's what God is doing in, in, in America right now, and, and that's affecting the world. You know, and the whole world is coming into what we call a revival. But I'm not comfortable with the word revival. A lot of people are calling and praying for revival, and I'm sitting here going, man, when I got saved in 1984, I don't think there's been very few times in, in how many years would that be that I've been saved, 84, 37 years. I haven't backslid. I have been on fire for God. Those of you that know me, you, you, you watch us. You know how I was as a young man in the youth group. I, I haven't lost that flame. It's only gotten stronger and stronger and stronger and stronger and more passionate. Now, that's not to pat oneself on the back. It's just simply saying that for me, revival doesn't mean a whole lot to me because I live in the spirit of revival. I, I live in the spirit of life again. I live in the spirit of fire and passion and, and excitement and zeal and a radical Christianity. Not one coward Christianity, one that hides itself unashamed. No, bold for God. And so revival, some people need a revival. Revival means life again. But reformation is a stronger word. It literally means to, to change. It's almost where you can get the word revolution. And, and a revolution is a purposeful overthrow of whatever you're trying to revolution or, or turn over or get going. Same way with Reformation. It's never pretty. It's, it's about change. And when, and when Reformation begins to hit a culture, the culture uh, reacts. When Reformation begins to hit uh, the spirit realm, hell reacts. And, and so this is what we're seeing. We're seeing not just revival. Now, the church in the United States of America, for the most part, they need a revival. Because churches have been dead dry, boring, or they've been so predictable based on man's interpretation on how to grow a church rather than read the book. You cannot have Pentecost without the Holy Spirit. You can't have churches without the Holy Spirit's presence and power. What are you building your church off of? What is your message built off of? What happens in your church, pastor, if the Holy Spirit is not welcome? You cannot have church without the Spirit of God. Now, they might say, well, well, the Holy Spirit's here. Well, then why don't you let him loose? Okay, take the, take the restrictions off the Spirit of God. And people say, well, you know, the Holy Spirit, he's, he's a gentleman. You know, and I said this in the first service. One day I was praying, and I said, Lord, you're just, you're just such a gentleman, Spirit of God. He said, no, I'm not. I stopped. I said, What? He said, I said, you're a gentleman. He said, no, I'm not. I said, okay, come here. I think you're a gentleman. Now, that's not saying that he is what we would define of being ungentlemanlike. You know, for example, I'm a gentleman. How do you know I'm a gentleman? I treat my wife with respect. I open the door for her. I train my children, take care of the lady. I esteem her with honor. I'm a man of morals. I'm a man of honor. My eyes are not on you, woman. My eye is on that woman. My eye is on God. I handle my money with honor. Are you, are you listening? So, so there, there is a, there's a standard that you have of a gentleman-like quality. If you come into my presence, I will be nice to you. If you be ugly with me, I will let you know you're ugly, and I'll have a few words with you. And I don't put up with stuff. But that's not ungentlemanlike. Most people, I meet you, I'll be nice to you. But if you have an agenda, I'll see it most of the time as a prophet. And I'll tell you it. And I don't like it. I don't play. But that doesn't make me ungentlemanlike. Does that make sense? So God is a gentleman in the sense that he is very respectful. He's very honorable. He's very loyal. He's very kind. He's very considerate. But he's not by the way of his, uh, his uh, administration or the way that he does things or the way that he chooses to move and to operate. He's not a gentleman. He'll interrupt you. He will argue with you. He will shut you up. He will also shame and embarrass and pull their pants down like the clown administration. He will expose. Right? He'll disrupt. He'll interrupt. He could sometimes care less about your makeup, ladies. Otherwise, he wouldn't cause it to cry off. 
He might move your hairpiece, men, and throw off your wig, woman. So you have to understand that. So let's talk about Reformation Revival. People are talking about revival, and when you talk about revival, it means life again, okay? You know, something that's been dead. Now, the United States, the church, really needs to be, li- be brought back to life again because, let's face it, a lot of churches have been dead. And, and I said this in the first service. You know, people aren't fighting for the right to have a dead church. But we're having to fight for the expression of liberty. Come on, we've been through a pandemic, scamdemic, that tried to take our liberties and our freedoms away. But we have to fight for liberty. People, listen, you, how many have ever been to a dead church? How many ever been to, to a dead service? Maybe you've been invited to something, you know, and you go into one of your relatives' churches, you know, you that are charismatic or whatever. Or maybe you've been in a charismatic church that's been dead. You, nobody's fighting for that. No. What's happening is they don't realize that the devil is fighting against them and is one, and now they're bound. But you have to press and fight for the spirit of liberty. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But you have to fight for that. Why? Because human nature is is to sometimes be quiet, passive, restricted, reserved. And especially depending upon where your demographics are or your culture is. The farther north you go in the hemisphere, the colder it is by way of temperature. But the colder it is by way of spiritual temperature. Most revivals that have hit the earth have not been as much in the northern hemispheres as it's been in the southern hemisphere. That's why they call it the Bible Belt. Even in the United States, for example. How how many understand and know what I'm talking about? Africa, right? There's been tremendous move of God. South America, Brazil, the Argentine revivals. You don't hear of them as much. You you see a few of them that have been up around Scotland and and England and places like that. But, But there's been a lot of the move of the spirits even south. So some of it has to do with demographics, and where we have to be careful in Nebraska is sometimes we get into a place where we have our sign that you come into the city, and it says, Nebraska, the good life. And what's happened is pastors have cooperated with that spirit. Yes, we are to give people the good life. I'm here to give you what Jesus gave. Jesus said, I've come to give you life and life abundantly. That is a covenant of social rights. That means as a pastor, if I don't preach healing, I'm not giving you the true good life. If, if, I don't, if I don't preach to you that you can be delivered from devils, that you can walk holy as he is holy, and, and if I don't preach to you that you can be delivered from sin, kept from sin, walk in holiness, come on, and that you can, whatever your situation is, the anointing of God can break that yoke and undo heavy burdens, you can be filled with the Holy Spirit, you can pray in tongues, you can prophesy. That is the life and life abundantly that Jesus offered. However, there's a, there's a demographic There's a mindset that gets on people. And what happens is they begin to say, okay, Nebraska, the good life. Oh, we're just good people. We're conservative. We're nice. Nothing wrong with being conservative. Nothing wrong with being nice. Nothing wrong with a good, relaxed, nice life. But that cannot be, if you want a restored Pentecost moment, cannot be the spirit that you carry. Because every devil in hell will make you so nice that you are a telephone pole when it comes with no life to the expressions of God. You'll be quiet, conservative, and nice. And most of the time, things don't happen in a nice, quiet, reserved, observing, critical type atmosphere. Amen? Amen? So I'm saying that because there is a revival. There's life again that needs to happen. But really, there's what's happening is a reformation. And you, you say, well, give me an example, Pastor Hank, and I'll get to our scripture. In, in John chapter 11, you, you remember the story of, of Lazarus. How many remember the story of Lazarus? And uh, they said, you know, Lazarus is dead. And people were crying and they were upset, even to the point where they blamed Jesus. They said, look, if you would have been here, my brother would have not, uh, wouldn't have died. And so there was a need of revival. There was something that was dead that needed to be alive again. And, and, and a lot of churches are exactly what they reported to Jesus about Lazarus. Man, by now it stinks. And so they needed a revival. They need, man, that, 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 that things are decaying, Lord. Uh, you, you know, the Holy Ghost hasn't moved in, church, in, in a church for years. Nobody's been healed, not on any Sunday, not on g- any given moment. People aren't even being prayed for in churches. Uh, people aren't allowed to be uh, filled with the Holy Spirit. They're not allowed to speak in tongues in churches. Well, that's called decay. So you could see what happened with Lazarus. There was a decay, and it began to stink. And I think the Spirit of God is he's having to smell what his church looks like and, 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 and what it sounds like. It's, there's a decay. 
a decline. Think about the love that has declined. People getting on Facebook, fighting each other, arguing with each other. There's been so much Christian arguing. Here you had a president, 45, that was fighting for your, uh, your religious liberties, was fighting for your God on the National Day of Prayer, mentioned over 14 times at least the name of the Lord's scriptures. You have the clown speak, and all he talked about was bozo things. You don't listen to a liar. They have their place in the lake of fire. They don't have their place in the White House. So... Here, here's the real deal. So there's been this decay, and part of it is because of the fighting and the constant, you know, comparing. And I'm like, you know what? People say, well, you're just worshiping 45. No, I'm not. I'm, I'm looking at a man who was fighting for us, and we didn't fight for him at the end of the day. Otherwise, you would have put a, never put a check mark on administration that wants to open the borders up to let anybody and everybody in a nation to attack your children and your future and maybe your city. Yes, you. And you put a check mark and put your agreement on it. And future babies being killed inside the womb and even outside. And an absolute contrary contradiction of what God said was truth about marriage and gender. And you put a check mark next to it because you didn't like 45 in his tweets. This is why we don't just need a revival. We need a reformation. We need change. We need something that's stronger than just coming into a church and experiencing great songs, great music, and and, and a nice message that makes you feel motivated. But what is it done? And what is it doing once we walk out of the church? Is it a, how is it affecting the, 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 the educational? When they want to indoctrinate our children with sex education, that's nothing more than pedophilia and perversion. They're preying on our children at very young ages. And we've got people who are in our school boards and, 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 and part of our city councils that are nutcases. What they stand for and what they legalize, all of the native, uh, all in the name of freedoms. No. And if you come against it, you're being discriminatory. No, you're not. That's that's different than what we dealt with with civil rights movement. These are moral issues. There's a big difference. So just having our little church meetings that make us feel good in revival is not enough. If you read in the book of Acts, and you're going to see with, with Pentecost, it wasn't just a nice little revival meeting where here they had you know, been with Jesus, 120 of them in an upper room, and, and they were infused with the Spirit of God. It didn't just stay in the four walls of the church. It began to affect with a reformation. It began to affect change. In fact, it began to affect the religious community where they were like, hey, you can't preach in that name. It affected even the political where they said, you keep doing this, we're going to arrest you. And they did, and some, they killed That's reformation. It affected people's mindsets and education. Because the Jews were coming and saying, how can these men being uh, ignorant speak with this authority? It was affecting all aspects of culture. People were coming and saying, look, we're really willing to burn our occult books. Come on. Acts 19. We're willing to walk out of the occult. We're willing to walk out of darkness. That wasn't just revival. That was reformation. And in John chapter 11, that's exactly what you see. You see Lazarus who is stinking. He needed to be revived, but something happens. And it always, it starts with a revival, yes. But it needs to be bigger than that. Same way with the United States. Why is God taking his time? Some people are accepting the results of a fraud gate. And they write petitions calling out the prophets. And I want to say, why aren't you raising your voice? And saying, Look, and that it's going to go away and how, somehow in 2022 and 2024. No, we need to deal with the thief now and he must pay back sevenfold. Really, sevenfold ought to be seven more years for 45 because you already stole one. We got Christians sitting out there signing petitions, calling out the prophets. Yeah, you know who you are. Nothing wrong with your statement and your petition. I agree for accountability. I agree for defining prophets and false prophets. I agree talking about prophecy. I don't like your spirit. And and listen, if Donald J. Trump was not attached to your petition, you probably wouldn't even have it. 
But why aren't you raising your voice and signing a petition and trying to unify a divided church? And let's get unified about abortion. Let's get unified about racism. Let's get unified about these mobs that are destroying cities when they don't get their way. Don't get your way. You're going to just set something on fire. Oh, really? You ought to be arrested and thrown in jail. So we don't just need revival. We need a reformation. And in John chapter 11, Jesus called the church forth or Lazarus forth. And he said, Lazarus, come forth. But notice there was two dimensions that happen in a revival. Number one is there's a, there's a spiritual component that happens. And the spiritual component is th- that you deal with unseen forces. Because Jesus was also speaking to the spirit of death. Loose him. Let him go. But then there's a natural component of human responsibility. People cry out, oh, God, you're welcome in our church. Holy Spirit, you're welcome. Oh, God, we want you to move. Open blind eyes. Open deaf ears. Let the lame walk. Come on, God. Do all kinds of glorious things. And yet they ignore that if you really get that prayer answered, there's going to be human responsibility. Which means you may have to be an usher. You may have to go serve in the kids' ministry because the church uh, triples in size. Rather than come Holy Spirit in the service, you're going to have to have to roll up your sleeves, get off your blessed assurance, and go work in the church. <laughs> Human responsibility. Somebody's going to have to make sure there's toilet paper for the revival that happens. <laughs> Somebody's got to make sure that the place is vacuumed and the doors are opened up and people fall under the power that somebody's going to catch them. There's a human responsibility. Well, what was the human responsibility with Lazarus? Loose him and let him go. In other words, Jesus was speaking to the person that was there that had to unwrap the grave clothes. When he called him forth with the spiritual command against the spirit of death, he didn't just twirl around like a, you know, like a, like a, like a ball of yarn. And, and Lazarus spun around 360 times and his grave clothes began to unwrap supernaturally. No. Jesus was speaking to the people. You loose him. Come on. Unwrap him. It was a human responsibility for their revival. Now, here's what happens. You keep reading in John 11. And and that life again, that revival began to become a reformation. Change. It began to confront. It was very bold. See, that's what reformation does. What's happening in the United States right now is God is wanting to revive his dead church but he's wanting to bring revival. He's wanting to bring change that's going to affect our government, our laws, our courts, our Senate. Come on, our House of Representatives, the Speaker of the House. Thank God. Throw water on her and let her melt. <laughs> Go away. I can't believe you said it. I'd say it right to her. I would enjoy saying it to her. What are you going to stand for? A reformation, man. They wanted to kill. They were so upset at Jesus. They were so upset that Lazarus was raised. The religious community, the politics. Come on, the, uh, the, 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 the religious community, the political community. Come on. They were so upset at this revival that turned into a reformation. So this is where we're heading. So let's look at my opening text. I don't know how I got off on this. The the thing that has been is what shall be. Thank you. You're kind. The thing that has been is what's going to be again. In other words, we're going to see some things again. I believe we're going to see the dead raised like Lazarus. And I believe we're not going to see wimpy churches, but we're going to see powerful churches that, that, that are going to turn the world upside down. Who's calling me? Oh, they're confirming my dental appointment. <laughs> Oops. How did I turn my, my flashlight off? Can you? Oh, here it is. Siri, turn the dumb thing off. I don't understand how to respond to that. Yeah, neither do the Democrats. Okay. 
So, the thing that has been is that which shall be again. <laughs> and that which is done is that which shall be done again. And there's none, no, nothing new under, I can't even preach now. <laughs> but, but, but here's the point. God repeats himself. Now you say, well, how does he repeat himself? Look at Ecclesiastes 7, 8. So kind of stay in the book of Ecclesiastes. Jesus' first miracle showed us something about what God does and what he's getting ready to do. There was uh, the story, John chapter 2, where Jesus was invited to a wedding at Cana. And how many remember the story? They were enjoying the wedding. They were enjoying the wine. And all of a sudden, they ran out of wine. And there was a period of time, I don't know how long it was, from when the wine ran out to the time that Mary said, Jesus, we ran out of wine. Right? And he listened to his mother. Whatever she said, you do. That's how I'm with my mom. Tell me something, I'll do it. Right, mom? No, I don't. Not always. I'm, I'm trying, mom. Please forgive me. I'm trying. I just want to be a Christian in my heart. So anyway, Mary goes, whatever he says, you know, you do it. But the point is, he turned water into wine, and there was a period of time between where they ran out of wine to where the new wine was given and poured out. This is why I say this. We've been between wines. And I say that prophetically speaking because how many of you have read stories about some of the great revivals of, of yesteryears where the dead would, would be raised? Like one of my favorite guys, if you want to study somebody that, that's watching or you're in this room, was a guy by the name of Smith Wigglesworth. How many of you ever heard? Oh, he was an amazing man. And he had such bold faith that he could literally go to a funeral and he would pull people who'd been embalmed out of the casket, pick them up, and he'd grunt, and he'd throw them against the wall. And so um, the guy would, you know, I don't know what he would do, but he'd come back to life. I mean, that's a guy I wanted to follow. And he would punch people in the gut, and they would be healed. So I tried that one day. I did. And so I was like 20 years old, and I thought I was Smith Wigglesworth. And I had been fasting and praying. And so I was going down the line, and I said, how many of you got a stomach ache? And they came up front, and I was 20 years old, and there was this guy. And I said, sir, he had his hands up. I said, I said well, actually, he had his hands kind of like this. I said, put your hands up. He put his hands up. I went, bam! I hit him in the stomach. He went, ooh, like this, and he gets up, and he starts pushing me, and the ushers had to grab us, man. I'm like, oops, guess that don't work for me. But I never punched anybody ever since. Did I ever tell you the time that I used to throw my coat like Benny Hinn? Do y'all want to hear it? Y'all, okay. So, y'all want to hear it? Write if you want to hear it in the comments. So, so anyway, so I was doing spiritual emphasis weeks, and I was preaching at, at, at 20, 21 years old uh, in, in Bible schools and Bible colleges that had, you know, two, 3,000 people, and they would ask me to come, and I was their age, and you know, I thought I was hot stuff. Listen, God has a way of dealing with pride. And so I thought I was hot stuff. And, uh, you know, anointed of God at 20, 21 years of age. And, I mean, I had, I had meetings where people would fall three, four rows, you know, and, and uh, just crazy, wild, you know, meetings. And so it was going to my head. And so I, I started watching Benny Hinn, and I was really moved because I said, God, I really want that kind of miracle, healing kind of anointing. And, and I kept hearing Benny's words, you have to pay the price. You know? <laughs> and so I thought I was paying the price. And so he would wave his coat. How many remember that? He, got, he got made fun of over that, but yet there was the power of God on it. So I decided that I was going to wave, start waving my coat. And in the first like, couple revival meetings, man, people were falling. I'm like, Hallelujah. It's, it's here. So in this one service, I took off my coat. Can I use somebody for a volunteer? Mike, I'll use you for a volunteer. So I had this old guy. Yeah, Mike, come up here for an old guy. Yeah, come on up here. <laughs> this old guy. Hey, he turned uh, the big, I won't tell people, but you had the birthday. 40. 40. He had yeah. the same 40th birthday that I did. So I was in this revival meeting, and I had my jacket. And uh, there was this old guy. You're not old, but this old guy came up. And he didn't have to believe in anything that I was saying. You could just tell. So I called people up. I said, come up if you need healing. And I was waving my jacket and people were falling. And I'm like, hallelujah. The anointing's here. Hallelujah. So 
I started to wave the blanket. And nothing happened. This old guy, he's looking at me. So finally, I decided to throw my coat on him. So you're me. So I'm going to show you what happens. I'm the old guy now. Are you ready? Are you watching? So Hank Kuhneman throws, kind of throw it like this. It landed on the guy's head. This, this old guy. It lands on his head. He is so mad, he goes like this. And he can't get it off his head. And so he's going over here, and he finally gets it off, and he grabs it, and he takes the one arm and the other arm, and he ties them together, and he starts going like this to my jacket. You know, th thank you, my brother. Let's give him a hand. Thank you, my brother. Thank you, my brother. Let's give him a hand for the, my brother. Benny, if you're watching, I love you and everything else. And so... I learned a lesson. So I had this woman come up to me afterwards. She said, God has a word for you. I said, what's that? She said, God has his own anointing <laughs> for you. Quit trying to be Benny Hinn. I said, okay. And I'm glad she rebuked me because, man, I could have gotten in trouble throwing my coat on people. I mean, what if he would have tore my, my arms? I mean, I, I didn't, you know, I hardly have any suits back in those days. But, but we've been between wines. We've been between moves of God to where it's like, come on, God. When's the last time we've seen blind eyes open? When's the last time we've seen people get on the wheelchairs? When's the last time we've seen bona fide miracles? Come on. Where they talk about people coming in in Oral Roberts uh, meetings and they had, uh, I don't even know what a goiter is. It's like a growth, right? I thought a goiter was like a squash or something. <laughs> but, but they would disappear. Can you imagine that? People with cancer, where you could see the tumors the size of basketballs, baseballs. Man, they'd go in and punch those things, come out, and bam, you know. The cancer would disappear. I mean, don't you want those days? So we've been between wine. It's like, Lord, the, the, the Holy Ghost outpouring has, has run out, but we need something fresh and something new. Now, here's the promise of Ecclesiastes 7, 8. Better is the end of a thing than the beginning thereof. And the patient in spirit is better than the proud in spirit. That's true. That's why you don't throw your jacket. Unless you're anointed to do so. Okay. So here's the thing. The end of a thing is better than the first. Let's go to the, uh, to the day of Pentecost. Because if what has been is what shall be again, and an end of a thing is better than the beginning, then we are in for an amazing outpouring of new wine of God. How many are excited about it? This is why we have to contend. We have to fight for the spirit of Pentecost. So let's look at what happened on the day of Pentecost so that we can understand. Thanks again, Mike, for your illustration there, helping me out. In Acts chapter 2, notice what it says in verse 1. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Notice they were assembling. What have they been trying to take away from churches? Canada, United States. They've been trying to take away our right, our liberty, our freedom to be in one mind and one accord as a people. That's why, listen to me, Christian. Now, I'm not talking about those of you that this is your online church. I'm talking about those of you that your church is open and that you feel called to your church, but you still have... And it was a meme that said, ask the children if they had regrets giving up their guns. And there were... Thousands, ten thousands of shoes that were piled in heaps from Nazi Germany under Hitler that took them into gas chambers and killed them. And guess how he did it? Slowly, he worked on mandatory requirements from the government that stole and took their liberties and their rights away. Are you here? All right. I think I'm done. No, okay, here we go. Okay. And suddenly, there came a sound from heaven. Notice suddenly. We're, we're going to see suddenly again. As a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like a fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. Notice not some, they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and they all began to do something. What did they do? Speak in tongues. How do you know they were filled with the Holy Ghost? Well, there was evidence. They all spoke in what? 
Shout it out. Tongues. Tongues. As the Holy Spirit gave them utterance. They weren't making up the words. So, see, the devil will tell you, oh, you're just making up those words. Really? When's the last time you just ever, you know, just tried to speak in tongues? Man, oh, you know, when I was 18 years old, I got filled with the Holy Ghost. I never before that time ever, ever tried to speak in tongues. I partied a little. But thank God that I worked a lot, so I didn't have time to go to a lot of parties. But when I'd go to a party as a stupid teenager, nobody said, hey, man, there's, there's a keg over there and grab some tongues. I'd be thinking they were talking about something else. Yeah, let's just leave it at that. But, but nobody offered me anything like that. So the devil. So they were all filled as the Holy Spirit gave them utterance. Now watch this. I want you to go back and I want you to look at something. Look at verse 2. Because the devil would love to make you passive, tight, uptight. <laughs> He's doing that with Christians, making them tight at uptight. Make you reserved, predictable, right? And, and notice that's not how Pentecost or the church. Now, this is the birthing of the church. This is not how the church was birthed. It was not birth tight, nothing happening, quiet, passive, and let's just say uh, traditional. There came a sound from heaven. Now, how did they know there was a sound? Okay, they're not the only ones that heard it. Look at verse 6. Now, the new translation says, And when this was loud... Or heard loudly, multitudes came together and were confounded. So not only was this sound that they heard so loud in the room, but it was so loud that it was heard out in the community. That is not a quiet church. That is not a passive church. That is not a tight religious church. The sound was so loud. Now, we've had people come in and they say, well, you know, I just think it's too loud in here. Really? Did you ever go up to Tom Osborne and say, Tom, Memorial Stadium is too loud? And Tom would probably look at it and say, well, I think, I think that's a good, good analogy. I think you're doing great. But he, he, he probably wouldn't come into agreement with you. In fact, they're fighting for more noise. And they're concerned, and they're going to move the student section to make more noise. But we have this religious mindset that somehow... Churches, the minute you walk in them, shh, Elmer Fudd, be very, very quiet here. The Holy Ghost is here. No. That's a religious demon. When you go before the throne of God, you're going to be shocked because there's the sound of many waters. Can you imagine the angels, and we don't know how many there are, that go around his throne constantly with the new revelation each time saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord. Can you imagine if God decides to speak that his voice is like the sound of, what, a thousand trumpets. They lifted up their voice, it says, loudly unto the Lamb. There is noise, but when people get into churches, they become quiet, passive, restricted. Praise and worship's going, and they stand there, and they show no expression. That's not Pentecost. Pentecost is about sound. Now, this is what I always tell our band. You just flow. You just go with the instruments. Why? Because there's something that happens with a sound. You say, well, what happens with the sound? Well, let's talk about it. What happens with sound? Sound always proceeds or comes before a manifestation. When God looked at the earth in Genesis chapter 1, the earth was without form, void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And God, what? Gave sound, said, let there be light. How many of you ever fired a gun? You ever fired a gun? Come on, Second Amendment. People, help me out here. Anytime. Now, Brent and I, we love shooting our guns. Amen? I love my Second Amendment, right? And I like the Second Amendment on these guns. Now, here, here's the thing. When I go to the shooting range, I pull, yeah, I just think about one particular gun. When I pull that trigger, I hear the sound of it. And then I see the manifestation. I hit the bullseye. Brenda is next to me. I hear the sound of her gun. 
I see the manifestation. Holes in the walls, in the ceilings up there, and all this. You know, so. <laughs> Are you done? I always tease her. I go to the gun range. I'm like, man, Brenda, you, you must have been here and didn't tell me. She said, why? Look at all these holes, honey. <laughs> but actually, the people that own the gun range says that Brenda's one of the best shots. She's, she's an amazing shot. So anyway, but... Don't you hear the sound of the gun blast before you see the manifestation of what it hits? Yeah, sound always precedes manifestation. But here's another thing about sound. Sound does something to you. Why do they want you to be noisy at a football game? Why is the concert of your favorite band loud? Why do they have woofers that the bass is so driving that you feel it? Because you're to be moved. If, they, if, if your favorite band came, if Elvis came, and, and, and it was all quiet, and he's up there and you don't hear anything, he's up there going like this. You're going to walk away going, that guy, what's his problem? Does he have something wrong with his leg? You're not going to be moved. You're not going to be shook up. You'll walk away going, I don't know why he's singing about being shook up. I ain't shook up. Ain't nothing. I don't feel nothing. No, because sound moves you. How do you know? Play music for a little one-year-old, two-year-old, and, and they move. They'll, they'll get to moving. And who taught them that move? It's in them. They're moved by sound. Now, the other thing about sound, why you need to protect the sound. This is why I always tell our, our band, it's not just about being able to emulate the latest songs that are out there, which is fine. Because, you know, it's good because people, you recognize the songs. It helps you to engage God. No problem. But you also have to create your own sound. Because sound does something else. Are you ready? You know what it does? It moves God. It does. Well, how is God moved by sound? Well, think about it. How is God moved? You look at Jesus. In Matthew 21, on Palm Sunday, they're putting down their, their garments. They're putting palm leaves in front of him. He's riding in on a colt. And they're singing what they always sang as the high priest came in with the sacrificial lamb every Palm Sunday. And they were singing, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And here's what's amazing. This particular time, Jesus as the high priest, now acting as the high priest, as the lamb, is listening to the sound that it stirs him so much that the religious spirit recognizes, uh-oh, Jesus is being stirred. That they say, hey, Tell these people to shut up. See, you never have to fight for traditional quietness, restriction, being dead. But notice what Jesus had to fight for. He had to fight for their right to be heard, to lift up their voice, to have sound, to be expressive, just like Pentecost. Religious spirits wanted them, just like he wants every church, to be quiet. I'm not talking about reverence, fearing God, Holy, when God comes in, we're on our face. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the spirit or the mindset of people and the church. Jesus said, listen to me, you religious spirits. If they shut up, these rocks will cry out. Because sound was stirring Jesus. How do you know? Keep reading. This story in Luke 19, the sound of their blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord stirred up Jesus so much like a man of war, according to Isaiah 42, that he will stir up his zeal like a man of war. He goes into the temple and he begins to cleanse it. And even Matthew 21, and he begins to prophesy over the city. That's another thing that sound does. Sound moves you, it makes religious demons nervous and affects things in the spirit realm. It moves God, but it moves the prophet. Yes, it does. How do you know? In the Old Testament, they would have the minstrel come. Well, I don't see that in the New Testament. You saw it with Jesus. When they were worshiping and declaring and singing, it moved Jesus in his prophet office. And he prophesied over the city of Jerusalem and he wept over it. So it's important that we protect, if we're going to have a rest restoration of Pentecost, you've got to restore and protect the sound. Now you say, well, what is that sound? That sound is not always loud, but if you're going to have a true Pentecostal experience, we're not fighting to be quiet. Most churches have no problem being quiet. 
Most churches have no problem being restrictive. <laughs> Most churches have no problem being tight. Now, some people can have a form of it, and it becomes a religious action. Let me give you an example. I'm not making fun of anybody. But I was invited to a church one time, and the church was probably only about as big as this stage, maybe smaller. And they had this big grand piano up there, and they had these very uh, four pleasantly um, um, so I don't get in trouble. You give me the words and I'll blame you. So four women that were very what? Very round. Okay, some lady blame her. I think you need to blame that lady over there. I think she said it. I think she did. Uh, let's say huge. I think somebody said huge. I think somebody. So there was four huge, huge. I think that was what we're going to talk about. Huge. So there was four huge, four huge. They were here huge. They were they were huge women. We're not against women. We're not against huge. Okay. <laughs> So you have to define all of that, so don't write about that, okay? I have a problem with you then. Now, here's the thing. These four, round, huge, pleasantly blessed, were up worshiping, and they were moving. I, I don't even know how they moved. And the whole ground, you know how it says in the book of Acts that the building shook? It wasn't because there was huge people there. That was the Holy Ghost. But this, they, I mean, I was like... I'm on the front line. I mean, you know, I've never had rhythm. I'm a white guy. I've never had rhythm in my life. But, man, that's the first time I had rhythm, man. I'm up there. As the, as the floor's shaking. And they were moving. And this, are you all here? Is this okay? I'm almost done. Can you come to the piano so I'll quit? So there was a grand piano with a vase with a flower in it. And they were moving and dancing. And all of a sudden, the vase fell over. And the whole church and the organ player all quit playing. And they said, the Holy Ghost. And they started going crazy. And I just got saved. I'm like. A vase this size falls over on a panel with a ton of weight in a small building. How is that the Holy Ghost? So you have the extreme on the other side. I mean, understand that. Let's move on, please, quickly. So, stand to your feet. So Pentecost expression is, is, is loud. It's, it's expressive. And what you, have to, what you have to protect is you have to protect that liberty because it was the Spirit of God. The Bible says where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. The Spirit of the Lord is what gave liberty in His infilling that caused these people to, in some cases, they were being accused of and being mocked for being drunk. Isn't that right? So Pentecost is loud, it's expressive. You say, well, how do you know? Let's just break this last, last verse down, and then we're going we're to call it a day here. Suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. Now, look at the words. A rushing a mighty wind. Okay, the word rushing. When you think of the word rushing, do you think of quiet? Or do you think of loud? Raise your hand if you think loud. Look at how many people. Okay, good. Good job. When you see the word mighty, you don't think pansy. Right? Right? I remember guys on the playground, I'm going to take you out. Really? You mighty guy, you? I mean, can you imagine if Rocky Balboa talked that way? <laughs> Mr. T's there, you know. Hey, Balboa. I show you real man, Balboa. Oh, really? I'm going to bust you up. <laughs> no, there's a reason they had the Rocky character not talk like that. I'm going to bust you up. No, it, he, he talked like, hey, let me tell you, you ain't nothing here. You hit me here. That's mighty. Which Rocky would you rather have? Hey, how you doing? Hey, how you do? You know, no, I'd rather take the other one. So there's rushing, there's mighty, and there's wind. How do you know that a wind is rushing and mighty? You hear it. How many ever heard rushing mighty wind? We've had a few here in Omaha. So this was a very loud moment. The church was birthed in this sound, this loudness, this expression. We cannot, this is what you've got to fight for in closing. 
What have we what have we've had to fight against, especially churches, since February of 2020? They put masks on our faces, told us we couldn't meet, shut us down, right? That's why you gotta open your churches up. Say, say, say we weren't essential. They were trying to get at the breath. Now, why is this important? How did what was the first thing that Adam received from God that gave him life? God, Genesis 2, verse 7, God breathed into Adam the breath of life. Really, that's plural in the Hebrew. It's not breath of life, as it says in the King James. It's breath of life. Because Adam had the ability to function in two realms, just like you. Adam was the first spirit-filled man. On the day of Pentecost, the church was spirit-filled just like Adam and had the ability restored to them like Adam, who could minister in, in two realms. The spirit realm, because God was a spirit and is a spirit, and he would talk to God in the cool of the day, spirit to spirit, right? And he would also have the ability to speak into the, to the heavens. He also had the ability to name the animals. And I like what Kat Kerr said. She said it wasn't just, hey, that's a rhinoceros. Hey, that rhinoceros, his name is going to be Fred. This other rhinoceros, his name is going to be Bob. Isn't that amazing? Because he had, he had the mind of God. We have the mind of Christ today. But today we have the ability to operate in two realms, the spirit realm and the natural realm. You can, as a spirit-filled believer, you can command things in the spirit and it moves. You can command things in the natural and it begins to take shape, right? How many are hearing what I'm saying? So, I don't know. Uh, so he breathed into him the breath of life. So I'm almost done. And what was given to Adam was breath. What we cannot let be taken from us is that breath, that expression, that sound. Are, are you listening? The loudness, the expression of it. That's why if you're going to be a Pentecostal church, you just got to, you got to be expressive, man. You got to be able to say amen over messages. You got to be able to, you know, express yourself to God. Well, I'm not there yet, Pastor. Nobody's saying you have to be here. But you know what? If you're here, go here the next week. Do that for a week or so. Get comfortable. And then don't get too comfortable. Keep it up here. Keep pressing for God is the key. All right. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. All right. Well, lastly, I'd like for Pastor Doug to come. The altar team is here. We had 26 people get filled with the Holy Ghost. I think 26. At least come up and get prayed for. I believe many of them did get filled with the Holy Spirit. We didn't check with them, so I don't want to be inaccurate. I always want to you know, be accurate with numbers and things like that. But I just want to ask you, if you're here today and you've never been filled with the Holy Spirit, with the evidence to speak in the tongues, maybe you're not even a Christian, you know? Is there anybody here you say, you know what, I want to give my life to Jesus Christ. I want to accept the Lord in my heart. Anybody here? I'd love to just pray for you invite you to accept Jesus. Is there anybody here that you are a Christian and you're like, hey man, I really want to have that experience. I want to be able to speak in other tongues as the Holy Spirit gives me the utterance. Is there anybody here? Now listen to me. Two things are required right now in this reformation that God is bringing upon this great change that we're going to see hit our politics, education, all of that that I said, is we need bold preachers, but we need bold Christians. We really do. Come on, we're, we're, we can be bold when we want to. So let's be bold about spiritual things. Anybody here, you've never been filled with the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues, I want to give that opportunity respectfully to you. Anybody here, just raise your hand up and say, you know what, preacher, that's me. Pray for me. All right, God bless you. That's okay. Keep your hand up. We're not, nothing weird is going to happen except God's going to, there's a couple people. Anybody else? Thank you. I'm going to ask you to do this. Just come out of your, your chair and just kind of go to the aisle. We're going to have you come up front. Pastor Brenda, could you come? We're going to give you some instruction.